It's an LED streetlight, but not just any old LED streetlight. It's a dead LED streetlight, and that is our favourite type. So this has been populated. It's got the facility for about, uh, say, 1, 2, 3, 4 by 6, 24 LEDs, but they've only used 8 in this particular model. And if I turn the power on to this, with a current limited supply, you'll see that this LED here starts flickering immediately, and after a while it will end up just conking out. But at least it does so in a manner that uh, goes short circuit. But that's, inevitably, it's going to fail and uh, arc internally, as these do, and then there's a possibility the rest will go out. But as it is, it would have been quite flickery um, until it failed. Now, I don't know the history of this. You see, this whole light was apparently made in 2020, and now it's 2024. It's the beginning of 2024, but it looks as though it was retired before then, and there'd have been time between the manufacturer and the installation, so did it get one or two years of use? I'm not really sure. But the failure mode is really interesting. And because I don't know the history, this light was absolutely full of mud and water. It had been stood upright outdoors and water had gone in the sort of the place you'd normally put the pole entrance into it. And it had basically filled up the whole LED array inside. So I don't know if this problem was caused by the bad storage in water because the LEDs were submerged in water that can permeate through and cause problems as it is. The circuit board here, you can see slight crows in the back. This is an aluminium core circuit board. It's got the aluminium panel and then there's a shim of fiberglass. Then there's the copper. Uh, the fiberglass insulates the copper from the aluminium and then there's the uh, solder resist, but they've used white here as a reflective coating. But I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this at all. You can see it there. See the bubbles. The material has delaminated from the aluminium. I wondered if the copper had delaminated from the fiberglass. But if you look at the side, it's actually spread out to here. And that does suggest, because there's no copper here, it's definitely delamination from the aluminium. Let's see if we can spudge in here and, and show this delamination. Maybe not. I can see a sort of ripple going across there. I think a blade might be better here, just going in. I already had a wee probe at the edge there, and it did. The knife slipped underneath. Uh, what about here? If I slot in, and then slide the knife under there, is that going to show it? Because it's definitely, it's delaminated, because as I squeeze it, it the, the bubbles can move. Underneath, hold on, there is a, there's a bit, this feels like sacrilege doing this to a circuit board. Oh, there's water under it. There is water and that actually makes me wonder if it is something that's being caused by the storage and the fact it was submerged underwater or has something else happened here that's caused that. Maybe it's the delamination has allowed water into it. Who knows? It's interesting. An interesting failure indeed. I've never seen the delamination like this. Hopefully it's not a thing affecting all these shredder lights. That would be a shame if it was. The circuit board on that, you've got little links down here. I've had to put a blob of solder over because uh, it had zero ohm links. And the point of those is that by default, uh, the negative goes to the bottom here and the positive goes to the top, if I recall correctly. And it basically snakes down and uh, by using these um, links you can actually divide it into different sections so if you need less LEDs you can just maybe highlight just this section in the middle which is what they've done by putting the two bottom links. The street light had two other things in it. So put that out of the way. Oh another thing when you turn the voltage up very slowly one LED lights then another then another and it's just because there's leakage through them. Again, this might just be the fact they've been submerged in water. It might have been retired in the first place just purely because it turned out not to be bright enough for the location. And it's just the storage that had the effect. Interesting, though. Very interesting. Oh, other things. There is uh, another connection here. You've got the two outer connections for the LED. The two inner connections are for a little R7 there. It measures round about 10K-ish. Uh, ambient temperature, so that's probably a thermistor, 10k thermistor for monitoring the temperature of the panel. Right, I'll get that out of the way. Quite surprised to see liquid in that there. Interesting. 
The other thing it had was this, and we'll take a look at this in another video, I think, because I've already taken one of these apart. It's the transient suppressor. It's designed to shunt spikes and glitches, and that is largely because if they're mixed with the on the same circuits as traditional ballasts, uh, like, say, high-pressure sodium, low-pressure sodium, metal halide lights, then um, these big inductive ballasts will potentially cause spikes and transients that can damage the semiconductor components. That was a problem that blighted the halogen, the electronic halogen transformer industry at the beginning. They would test these halogen transformers on the bench. They'd be working perfectly, the electronic ones. They'd put them out on site. What actually happened is when people turned the switch off, the collapsing field from the magnetic transformers of the same circuit produced a high voltage spike and uh, it uh, caused damage to the electronic components and other issues. So these, this is designed to bridge basically live to neutral, neutral to earth uh, with the gas discharge tube here in between the earth. And there's also a little circuit here for an LED that should normally light, and if it doesn't light, then it's faulty. Let's take a look at the driver that was in this one, which was also waterlogged, unfortunately. Uh, this, uh, I've given it a clean, but you know, who knows what state it's in. This here, this old traditional ballast, uh, thanks Jerry, who sent me this ballast. This old traditional ballast, a Phillips ballast, um, would, uh, which is rated 80 watts, uh, this one, I've seen ballasts submerged completely underwater in lights and you open it up, there's a deluge of water, rusty water comes out and then basically speaking, you let the thing dry and the thing just works again. That wouldn't happen with these. So let's compare what's in, in a traditional high pressure sodium light or uh, many dis different discharge lamps. Big chunk of steel with copper wire wrapped around it. Very, very simple, very functional. What's in the LED light? Two computers uh, on this because I can see two programming ports. There's one programming port on the high voltage side. There's a program port on the low voltage side. Plus, you've got the little antenna here, a magnetic loop antenna for the non-contact programming of these, uh, which is not compatible with the Philips one, incidentally. And then it's just smothered. It's got hundreds of components all over it. It's smothered from top to bottom on both sides with components. And I have to say that, you know, which is going to last longest? These ones that lasted several decades are these ones that will probably last five years tops before they start having problems, maybe even less than that, particularly if uh, there are excessive transients or water gets in. It's just, it seems very strange. And I know these ones have the added functionality of DALI the, and other lighting networks that will uh, allow remote control of intensity. But, you know, the same thing could be done with a traditional ballast and then sections of LEDs being switched in. Strange the direction they've gone. It's, I think they've gone too far. Uh, when I worked with Hussman Refrigeration, they embraced the new era of electronic refrigeration control and they went too far, really too far. It ended up their control panels were just stacks of circuit boards, very hard for maintenance and they were very problematic. And then they had a renaissance. They went back to traditional uh, electrical controls with very minimalist electronics at that point in time. Now, something I'm noting here, and I like this. You see the transformers get multiple bobbins on it. I think the middle one is the middle one? It looks as though... Oh, the middle one may be the primary. And the outer ones may be the secondary. Uh, but they are... You know, they the core here has uh, a split core. So the sec primary and secondary seem to be wound in separate sections of bombs. I wish more people did that. Because that gives much better electrical separation. Not that you'd think you'd need it in a street light. But there we have it. Uh, lots of filtering, a fuse, filtering, com mode suppression, choke, metal ox, everistors, all sealed up inside plastic for some reason. Heat shrink sleeving with glue. Why? It's all puffed up as well. Very strange. Uh, but there we have it. Uh, I've never seen the LED panel fail like that, delaminate. But I do wonder, given there was moisture in it, was that before 
or after its storage? That is a tricky question. It's very hard to answer that without knowing its full history. If you've worked with shredder lights, uh, or if you work in the street light industry and you take some of these out that have failed, could you just take a look at the circuit board and tell me if you see any of the blistering on it? Another thing worth mentioning, and this is quite annoying, when I took the plastic cover off, the lens cover off this LED panel, the screws were stainless steel into aluminium or aluminum if you're in America and uh, two of them sheared they just sheared off and they didn't come out the aluminium um, and they broke very easily which means that the idea of changing the panel the panel would have been easy to change otherwise particularly because there's no heat sink compound in the back of this one probably because it is uh, such low power um, it would have been easy to just basically take the panel off push the little latches under the wires put the new panel in put the cover back on and you'd been back to start, but instead now there's broken screws and you're never going to get quite the same seal. But interesting stuff, well worth exploring. And uh, I'll take a look at this and I'm not going to reverse engineer it completely because it's ludicrous, but I will look for key components in this. But this one I will take a look at because it's different to the uh, other surge suppressor I looked at. And th those are always interesting for protecting your home electronic stuff. There we have it interesting failure of a Schroeder LED streetlight.